Good afternoon. The Secretary General will update you uh, on today's sessions uh, of uh, the NATO Defence Ministers, and then we'll have time for a few questions. Secretary General. Good afternoon. Uh, NATO allies uh, continue to uh, strong diplomatic efforts uh, to find a political solution to the serious crisis uh, triggered by Russia's uh, military build-up in and around Ukraine. Despite Moscow's claims, we have seen no sign of withdrawal or de-escalation so far. On the contrary, Russia's build-up appears to continue. We continue to monitor developments very closely. We call on Russia uh, to do what it says and withdraw its forces from the borders of uh, Ukraine. This will be an important first step towards a peaceful political solution. Today, we met with our close partners, Ukraine and Georgia. We addressed the continued threat of Russian aggression, the deteriorating security situation in the Black Sea region, and NATO's strong political and practical support for both countries. NATO and allies are helping Ukraine boost its ability to defend itself. Self-defense is a right um, enshrined uh, in the UN Charter, and allies are helping Ukraine to uphold that right, including with um, trainers and military equipment for Ukrainian armed forces, cyber and intelligence expertise, and with significant financial support. We also discussed the presence of Russian forces in the Georgian regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the vote of the Russian Duma recommending the recognition of the non-government controlled areas of Donetsk and Luhansk. We all agree that uh, uh, would be a, a further blatant uh, violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, and of the Minsk uh, agreements undermining the efforts uh, to find a political solution in the Normandy format. Today, Allies confirmed that NATO's door remains open. Any decision on NATO's membership is for NATO allies and aspirant countries to take, nobody else. The right uh, of each nation to choose its own path is absolutely uh, fundamental for European and transatlantic security, and it must be <coughs> respected. NATO allies um, restated their strong support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, of both Georgia and Ukraine. We cannot accept a return to an age of spheres of influence, where big powers bully, intimidate or dictate to others. The, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> there can be no decisions about Ukraine without Ukraine and no decisions about Georgia without Georgia. We agreed that in times of tension, dialogue is even more important. NATO remains open to engaging with Russia in good faith. Allies are ready to sit down with Russia in the NATO-Russia Council, address a wide range of issues and find common ground. In the final session of our ministerial, we met with our close partners, Finland, Sweden and the European Union. We share the same values, we face the same challenges, and the crisis in and around Ukraine affects us all. So we agree that uh, it is even more important now that we continue to work together and complement each other's efforts to bring this crisis to a peaceful uh, solution. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll go to Wall Street Journal. Uh, thank you very much. Dan Michaels with the Wall Street Journal. Um, are you concerned, Mr. Secretary uh, General, the re comments, reports <coughs> today out of Russia about hostilities around Donbass, uh, uh, f firing um, and incur possible incursions could be used as a pretext for Russia to uh, attack? So we are concerned that uh, Russia is trying to stage a pretext for an armed attack against Ukraine. Um, it is still uh, uh, no clarity, no certainty about the Russian intentions. We don't uh, know what will happen, but what we do know 
is that Russia has amassed uh, the biggest uh, force we have seen in Europe for decades uh, in and around Ukraine. And, uh, and we also know that uh, there are many Russian intelligence officers operating in Ukraine. They are present in Donbass, and we have seen attempts to stage um, a, a pretext uh, uh, false flag operations uh, to provide a, an excuse for uh, invading uh, Ukraine. So, of course, this is of concern. Uh, I cannot go into the, uh, uh, the details of the different reports, uh, but uh, this is the reason why we are so closely monitoring what is going on, and also why uh, NATO, NATO allies have exposed uh, the Russian actions, the Russian, the Russian plans, and the Russian efforts uh, 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 when it comes to disinformation, because we believe that that makes it harder for them to act, harder for them to invade uh, Ukraine, and uh, we, we continue to call on Russia to de-escalate, to withdraw forces, and to engage in a political dialogue with NATO and NATO allies. Okay, <coughs> uh, we'll go to BBC. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. I mean, you know, you've accused Russia of, of disinformation. I just wonder whether they could uh, make the same charges at the NATO alliance. Um, there were predictions, for example, that there might be an invasion on the 16th, which never happened. Russia has always said it's not uh, intending to invade Ukraine, um, accepting that they've got more than 100,000 troops. Also, you're saying, you know, we're not clear as to how many troops there are. Are there 100,000, more than 100,000, 130,000, 170,000, 150,000 is the other figure. So I just wonder, if, is there a danger that, you know, in accusing... Russia of dis disinformation, they can just turn to you and say, you've put out disinformation about coups that haven't happened, about false flag operations that haven't happened. How would you respond to that? Partly by just referring to that what we have described are facts on the ground. Uh, and of course, we have shared intelligence, we have shared information that we have collected, but this is also information which is now available for everyone. It's something you can monitor by, by commercial satellites. So actually now no one is, is trying to deny the, 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 the fact that Russia has uh, a large force on the, on the border of, of Ukraine. So that's, uh, that's publicly available information. Um, uh, what nobody knows, and we have been clear about that the whole time, is that we, we know their capacity, we know the forces they have amassed, but of course we don't know with certainty their intentions. But if, if you combine what we know about their forces, what we know about the threatening rhetoric, they have stated clearly that if we don't uh, meet their demands, there will be uh, military technical consequences. And we know the track record of Russia. They have used force against Ukraine before. If you combine that, and on top of that, also put the, the fact that they have a lot of intelligence officers operating inside Ukraine, if you combine all of that, there is reason to be seriously concerned. And that's the reason why we are conveying so clearly that if they use force, it will have a high cost for Russia. That's why NATO allies provide support to Ukraine so they can defend themselves, and also why we have increased the presence of NATO troops in the East. All of this we do to try to prevent an attack on Ukraine. So the fact that we are describing risk uh, doesn't mean that we uh, believe it would ha happen with 100% certainty, uh, we describe that risk, that threat, uh, also to prevent it from happening. So the main story, the main message has been the same from NATO uh, for months. When, when NATO allies started uh, uh, in, also in, in the fall, in last autumn, to describe the build-up, uh, that was questioned. We also described the, 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 the most likely plans that they will actually reach more than 100,000 troops, that was questioned. That has now happened. And now we need to prevent the next step from happening, that they're using this force against Ukraine, and that's exactly why we are doing all the things we are doing in calling Russia to de-escalate, in, in also sending a clear message about the high costs they have to pay if they, uh, if they use force again. Okay, we'll go to the, uh, to the back, the National News Agency of Ukraine. Yep. <coughs> Uh, Dmitry Shkurko, National News Agency of Ukraine. Uh, Secretary General, according to the public uh, 
publicly available information coming from Ukraine. Russian troops are not withdrawing from <coughs> Belarus and just maneuvering uh, along uh, the borders of Ukraine. So that my question is, uh, do NATO, NATO share the Ukrainian concern that those troops could be staying in Belarus for constant base? And uh, what would be the reaction of NATO if uh, that happened? Thanks. So. As I think what we have seen over many years now is a deterioration of uh, the European security environment. Uh, with the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, with the Russia's support to the separatists in, in, in Donbass, and now with uh, the large number of combat-ready troops uh, in and around uh, Ukraine. And also, of course, the closer and closer integration of uh, Russian and Belarusian uh, forces. Uh, so that's exactly why uh, we have reacted in the way we have in NATO. Uh, we have uh, strengthened our presence in the East with a modest presence, with a defensive uh, presence, uh, with the battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, in the Baltic countries and Poland. And that's also the reason why we now, in light of what has happened uh, in, uh, in and around Ukraine and, uh, and, uh, and the presence of um, tr Russian troops in Belarus, that we are now uh, considering the next steps, including uh, battle groups in Romania and in the southeast of the uh, alliance. So uh, NATO has to respond when we see um, aggressive actions by, uh, by Russia, uh, but we continue to strive for dialogue, for de-escalation, and we believe it is important to, to talk. NATO believes in diplomacy, we believe uh, in, di in dialogue, and therefore we continue to, to call on Russia to engage in good faith in dialogue with NATO. Okay, we'll go to Imedi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Secretary-General, can you tell us more about the meeting with the uh, um, Defence Minister from Georgia? And uh, we are waiting also NATO-Georgia uh, exercises in March. And the second point, um, um, Mr. Zelensky today said, uh, Ukraine is welcome to NATO, yet not all members of the alliance. How would you respond to that? Thank you so much. So we had a good meeting with uh, both uh, the defense minister from uh, Georgia and, uh, and uh, Ukraine. Um, I think uh, in that meeting, allies um, expressed very strongly their uh, support to both countries, their territorial integrity and sovereignty. And allies provide support uh, uh, to Georgia and Ukraine in different ways. We do it in the NATO framework. We provide uh, um, bilateral support, uh, training, capacity building. Uh, and um, and uh, there will be an exercise in Georgia later on this year, and, uh, and of course, uh, NATO will be part of that because it's an exercise we do together, and, and it demonstrates in a way how we are working closely together. Uh, the Black Sea region uh, is of strategic importance for NATO, so what happens there matters for us. We are uh, three littoral states, um, NATO allies that are uh, Black Sea littoral uh, states, and we have two very close partners, Georgia and Ukraine. So to work closely with them is uh, important for us, important for, for the partners, and that was also clearly uh, confirmed uh, today. Well, also, we, we, we in our, our position has not changed. The, the decisions made at, uh, at the Bukhara summit still stands, but the focus now is on reform, is uh, to help both Ukraine and Georgia to uh, to modernize uh, their defense um, and security institutions, and we continue to focus on that. Reuters. Uh, hi there, Phil Stewart from Reuters. Uh, Belarus's president said today his country could host nuclear weapons if it feels threatened by the West. What would be your response? So, NATO is not a threat. NATO is a defensive alliance, and we have proved for more than 70 years that uh, we are there to protect and defend. And our deterrence is uh, there not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent the conflict. Um, uh, we are, uh, uh, of course, concerned about what we see, that uh, Russia is uh, modernizing its nuclear-capable missiles. They have deployed them to Kaliningrad. Uh, we have seen uh, also Iskander missiles in Belarus. And Iskander missiles are dual-capable missiles that can also carry uh, nuclear warheads. That's part of the pattern we see. And the reason why we are uh, concerned and why we have been concerned for 
uh, over a long period of time because this is a development, a pattern that has taken place over several years. One of the most important agreements uh, NATO allies uh, has reached uh, uh, and made with uh, Russia was the INF Treaty, banning all intermediate range uh, weapons in uh, so globally but also in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, and uh, Russia deployed new missiles violating that treaty. And, uh, of course, that has undermined the security of all of us. So, so we are taking the necessary uh, decisions and steps to be able to protect all allies, also in a more uh, dangerous and unpredictable security environment, including caused by the uh, Russian uh, nuclear investments and uh, modernizing uh, capabilities. Okay, Deutsche Welle, just behind the lady there. Thank you. Um, Secretary General, could you tell us what has to happen on the ground so that NATO can state those are real signs of de-escalation? And a second question, uh, Russia is apparently about to hand over their response to the U.S. proposals. Are you also expecting them to send a response to your proposals, a proposal as well? Thank you. We are waiting for the response uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, we uh, received from Russia in December uh, a draft uh, uh, security treaty that Russia wanted to sign with NATO. Uh, we um, met in the NATO-Russia Council, uh, where we also this proposal was discussed. Uh, we have sent to Russia our proposals, uh, where we actually uh, uh, list and go through areas like uh, arms control, missiles, um, uh, transparency of military activities, and we believe that these are topics where there is room for um, common ground to find solutions that will improve the security of all of us, for NATO allies and for the people of Russia. Arms control is, is, is good for all of us. It's, it, 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 it will strengthen the security uh, for Russia and for NATO allies. So, so uh, the reason why we have conveyed these proposals is that we believe that uh, if we sit down in good faith, as we've done in the past, uh, we can actually reach um, uh, agreements which uh, are uh, strengthening the security of all uh, countries, including, of course, Russia. Um, uh, we are waiting for the response. We have not yet received any response, um, but I continue to believe that the NATO-Russia Council that was established by Russia and NATO allies is the best platform to engage when NATO and Russia uh, um, have issues to discuss. Uh, and uh, the NATO-Russia Council is an all-weather uh, institution. Uh, it's uh, even more important that we meet now when tensions are high and things are difficult. And therefore, we are ready to meet. Uh, I invited Russia to a series of meetings in the NATO-Russia Council to address their concerns, our concerns, and to try to find a common way uh, forward. Uh, then uh, your first question was? <clears throat> we have to see a real withdrawal. And of course, you have to understand that this is a build-up that has taken place over many months. And over the whole period, it's actually started last spring, uh, we have seen uh, the number of troops going a bit up and down. And we have seen some forces moving in and some moving out. But the trend, the net effect has been a steady increase. But you know the fact that you're putting a, a battle tank on a train and move it in some direction doesn't prove uh, withdrawal of, of, of troops. That's not, not the same as real de-escalation because these capabilities are moving around all the time, in and out. So it has to be a meaningful withdrawal, a meaningful de-escalation. That is what we are waiting for. So far we have not seen that, but of course this can change. And that's exactly what we are hoping and working for, that um, we uh, see that Russia actually does what they are saying, that uh, we see a real, significant, meaningful reduction of uh, the Russian troops in and around Ukraine. Okay, we'll try to take two quick uh, questions online. Uh, Fox News, Greg Falkett. Thank you, Juana, and thank you, Mr. Secretary General. My question is this, uh, Secretary General, from the latest information that you are receiving, all the reports on the Russian troop movements, does Russia have enough troops, have enough hardware, 
on its borders with Ukraine to stage an invasion now? And if so, what could that invasion look like? They have enough uh, troops and enough uh, capabilities to launch a full-fledged invasion of Ukraine with uh, very little or uh, no warning time. And that is what makes the situation uh, so uh, dangerous. Uh, so we know about their capabilities, but of course we don't know with certainty about their intentions. So it remains to be seen what they actually do. But, but, but you have so many combat ready troops um, in and around Ukraine. Uh, it, it's, it's not a normal exercise. It's not a normal, in a way, uh, activity on your own territory. This is something which is threatening an independent sovereign nation. And they can launch an attack with extremely, uh, with hardly any warning time at all. And that's the danger. Uh, and that's the reason why we continue uh, to call on them to uh, de-escalate. It's never too late uh, to de-escalate. It's never too late to find a political solution. And we are ready to sit down and uh, address their concerns and find uh, ground, uh, common ground for a political solution. And for the last question, we'll go to Financial Times and uh, John Paul Rathbone. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much uh, for, uh, for this, uh, Secretary General. I'm just wondering what would happen if we're heading for a, a situation not of war or peace, but of sustained pressure. What does that mean for NATO and its allies, especially in terms of sanctions and what might trigger them? Thank you. Regrettably, I think what we are seeing now um, is uh, a kind of new normal for European security. Because we have seen this trend over many years, where Russia contests fundamental principles for European security, and where, there are, uh, and, uh, where, and where they're willing to, to, to use force, as they've done against Ukraine, Georgia, but also to threaten uh, with the use of force to intimidate uh, countries in, in Europe. Um, and uh, we have seen this development over some time, especially since 2014. And that's the reason why NATO has responded, because we don't have any choice uh, than to make sure that we continue to preserve peace and continue to prevent any room for miscalculation, misunderstanding about our ability to def defend and protect all allies. So we have increased our presence in the Eastern part of the Alliance. Uh, we are now actually, we have decided at this defense ministerial meeting that uh, we have uh, asked our military commanders to uh, look into advice on uh, the next steps for a more longer term uh, increased presence uh, in the eastern part of the lines, including with battle groups um, uh, in Romania and other countries in the east, uh, central uh, and southeast of the alliance. Uh, so, um, so um, for me, this just, um, underlines the importance of NATO's dual track. We need to be strong, we need to be united, we need to be firm, but at the same time, we are always ready uh, to uh, find uh, a peaceful, diplomatic uh, solution through dialogue. NATO believes in dialogue, we believe in diplomacy, and we are ready to engage in good faith with Russia on that tomorrow. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Thank you. Thank you.